When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you and peace this day from God our Creator and our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. When I was younger, one of my favorite things to check out from the library were books from the Choose Your Own Adventure series. Anybody else remember those? Choose Your Adventure, right? They looked like short chapter books. But the way that it worked is you would start at the beginning, and there'd be a premise, the beginning of the story. Maybe you were walking through a strange forest or playing at the beach, and then something critical would happen. You'd find a treasure chest or a mysterious door or a strange piece of fruit or a fork in the path, and then you as the reader had a choice. If you choose to take the right fork, turn to page 16. If you choose the left, Turn to page 27, and you'd flip ahead to whatever page you had chosen, and the story would continue until another critical choice would pause the action, and then you'd have to make another choice and turn to another new page, and you would repeat this until you finally came to an ending. There was an invitation implied with each page that you turned, the story is yet unfinished. The choice is yours. How will you keep the story going? When the women in our gospel today came to the tomb, they thought the story was over. Jesus had been executed. He had breathed his last. He had been buried in the tomb. All that was left for them to do was to come and tend to his body. But when they arrived at the tomb, nothing was as they expected. The stone, far too heavy for them to move, had already been rolled away. Jesus was not in the tomb, but there was a young man in a white robe there, sent as a messenger from God, and he spoke words to them that were the very words that their hearts longed to hear, but the very words that were also far too good and too unprecedented to seem true. He has been raised. He is not here. The women are given instructions to go find the disciples, to tell them that Jesus is going on ahead of them to Galilee, that they will see him there. And the women, overwhelmed with amazement and terror, as any of us would be in that moment, leave the tomb silent, heading who knows where, to do who knows what. This is where the Gospel of Mark leaves off. He doesn't tell us what the women do next, whether they eventually break their silence and talk to the disciples, or whether they head to Galilee and see the risen Jesus for themselves. We don't know whether they dance or cry or pray. 
Mark doesn't say anything more about Jesus and his disciples reuniting. Mark doesn't say anything about Jesus' ascension. Mark does not write a nice, tidy conclusion to his gospel, exhorting or encouraging his listeners. If we're looking for closure, Mark's gospel isn't going to give it to us. But maybe, maybe Mark's open-ended gospel is precisely the gospel we need right now. One of the reasons that this past year of pandemic has been so exhausting and so disorienting is that we have been stranded in this space without closure. We have sheltered in place and socially distanced and masked up and waited to get vaccinations, and it's all been open-ended uncertainty. Lack of closure, lack of knowledge about when closure will come. Grief is disorienting like this as well. It too comes in waves without a predictable timeline or path or an end date that we can count on. As humans, we yearn for closure. We want this foothold. We want a sign, anything, that will get us to a natural and satisfying ending to this chapter in our story. But friends, in these moments, when closure perhaps hasn't yet come for us, Mark's gospel meets us, where terror and amazement and silence still linger and where our story is still open-ended, and where there are still pages left to be turned. The women leave the tomb, and the story trails off, and that leaves the story of resurrection lingering with us, and nagging at us, and working its way into our hearts. See, I think Mark doesn't finish the story because he knows that the work is not done yet. Resurrection is not over and in the past, and it's not a closed story. The story of Christ's resurrection continues past the women at the tomb, past the disciples, past the first churches, through the generations, and onward through our lives. The end of Mark's Gospel offers an invitation to us. The story is yet unfinished. The choice is yours. How will you keep this story going? And how is God writing the story of resurrection through you? That is the question today. How is it that you or any of us will go from the empty tomb to bring life into this world? How are you going to let God write the story of resurrection through your life? It can happen in small ways. Sending cards to neighbors and elders who are lonely, making a double batch of dinner and bringing a meal to a friend, listening without judgment when someone needs to pour out their heart, caring for other people's children, healing bodies and spirits as you are blessed to do so, marching for a cause, donating to advocacy groups, leading with compassion in all your interactions, tending to this natural world with care and reverence. These, and so many more things, are all acts of resurrection. Each of them leads us closer to the end that God is preparing for us, that image from Isaiah of a grand feast for all people, death swallowed up forever, tears wiped away, the earth restored, God with us, salvation and rejoicing. But meanwhile, by God's help, we are the ones turning the pages, helping advance the story, trusting the Spirit through all the twists and turns left to come. Because the story is not over, the pulse of resurrection beats on in our hearts and in our lives. Sarah Miles, in her book Jesus Freak, writes, quote, Raising the dead? 
This is what Christians do every Sunday, after all, when we stand around in our churches eating little wafers or pieces of whole wheat pita, saying aloud that Christ is risen. It's what we do whenever we continue in simple, literal acts. Breaking bread, praying without hope of perfect outcomes, admitting our weaknesses, and loving people who don't deserve it. It's what we do when we remember that death is not the end. And then she continues, quote, Jesus is real, and so, praise God, are we. Every single thing the resurrected Jesus does on earth, he does through our bodies. You are fed, you are healed, you are forgiven, you are pronounced clean, you are loved, and you are raised from the dead. Go and do likewise, she says. Go and do likewise. This is the invitation that Easter extends to each of us. So having peered into the empty tomb, what will you do next? How will you take your terror and your amazement alike and go into the world looking for the risen Christ who goes ahead of you? How will you let God bring resurrection into the world through you? What is the story that God is writing on your heart for the sake of the world? As a blessing for this waiting time between Christ's resurrection and our own, as a benediction for the terror and amazement that accompany you from the empty tomb and back out into the world, I invite you to hear now these words from the poet Lucille Clifton entitled Spring Song. The green of Jesus is breaking the ground, and the sweet smell of delicious Jesus is opening the house, and the dance of Jesus' music has hold of the air, and the world is turning in the body of Jesus, and the future is possible. All you who have been baptized into Christ's death and raised from the waters, all you who have planted prayers for healing and forgiveness at the foot of the cross, all you who have entered the shadow of the tomb, all you who have encountered divine mystery beyond comprehension, all you who are ready to be amazed by new and renewed life, you are the ones through whom the story of resurrection continues. Go, therefore, into all this world and bring it to life. Amen.